So I got off work early today and ended up uh, having a lot of free time here tonight. So uh, I figured I would do a rather spontaneous brew session. So I just kind of came up with a recipe out of nowhere and uh, decided that I was going to brew tonight. So we are gonna have what's gonna turn into likely a late night brew. I'm probably not gonna finish up until about midnight, uh, but it's a style I've been wanting to do for a bit and that is an Imperial Red IPA. Hey loyal viewers, it's me Steve here and uh, through the magic of editing I have traveled to you from the future to inform you that every single time that I say the phrase Imperial Red IPA or Double Red IPA, what I really mean is American Strong Ale. We'll get into why exactly that is at the end of this video, but the beer that came out of this very seat of the pants brew was not bad, but definitely not an Imperial Red IPA. This is a very interesting example of an American strong ale. Think Arrogant Bastard by Stone. All right, anyway, let's continue on with the video and uh, just keep that in mind that this is not an Imperial Red IPA. This is an American strong ale. All right, I'll see you at the end of the video. So a strong beer is needed in my current lineup. So uh, I have four beers right now that are around 5% ABV, and by the time this one is ready to get kegged, at least one or two of those kegs is gonna be kicked and ready to go. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and move forward with this strong beer right now. So an Imperial Red IPA, it is a double IPA with um, kind of the characteristics of an amber ale. So we're talking a lot of caramel malt and a deep dark red color. So I brewed a red IPA before with great success. And uh, this recipe is actually very similar to that in its makeup, just many things are scaled up and there's a couple of different changes, especially with the hops. Uh, so what we're gonna do is try to go for something that's around 9% ABV and a serious, like, you know, 110 plus IBUs worth of bitterness. This is a style that I used to hate uh, before I really got into beer and brewing. Uh, because it's just so aggressive. It's a ton of flavor. It's a lot of bitterness. It's a lot of malt character. It's a lot to process. Um, this is a very bitter, aggressive, and in-your-face beer that uh, it's really only a select group of people like. So you're gonna like it if you're a hophead, um, but you're also gonna like it if you really like big, strong beers, I think. It should be relatively bitter, but uh, overall a pretty fun and strong beer to brew. The recipe is 10 and a half pounds of two row malt, uh, four pounds of Munich malt, three quarters of a pound of caramel 60, uh, half a pound of caramel 120, and half a pound of carapils, plus 0.1 pounds of chocolate malt to bring that color around and add a little bit of a nice, subtle roasty toasty note in there that shouldn't affect too much. Um, and then a pound and a half of table sugar added at the end of the boil to bring our ABV way up. Um, as far as hops go, we're gonna be adding, let's see if I can remember this, we're gonna be bittering with Simcoe and Chinook, and that's gonna be a half an ounce of each. And then we're gonna do, and that's a 60 minute edition, uh, and then we're gonna do a 30 minute edition with half an ounce of Simcoe, Chinook, and Amarillo. And then we'll do a 10 minute edition with the same half an ounce of Chinook, Simcoe, and Amarillo. Uh, and then we're gonna do a Whirlpool at about 170 to 180 degrees for 20 minutes with an ounce each of Chinook, Simcoe, and Amarillo. So it's gonna be a really strong Pacific Northwest kind of hop uh, combination coming out of this with a ton of pine, a ton of citrus hitting it. And on top of that, we're gonna have this really beefy malt profile in there that uh, should have a little bit of caramel sweetness. So shooting for a original gravity somewhere around 1080 and hopefully if that goes all the way down to about 1010, we'll get about eight and a half to 9% alcohol. So we're gonna mash this at 150 degrees for 90 minutes. That gives us a little more fermentability, a little less body in the beer, uh, something that's gonna be fine because we're gonna have a lot of residual sugars from the caramel malts. Uh, so body is, having sufficient body is not gonna be a problem. So I'm gonna ferment with two packets of rehydrated USO5 dry yeast, and that should get the job done just fine. As far as water goes, obviously we're gonna wanna have more sulfates than chlorides in order to accentuate the hot bitterness. So this is my water profile. It's gonna be 78 parts per million of calcium, 22 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, uh, 245 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and then I think it was, yeah, and then 36 parts per million of carbonate. So in order to achieve that profile, 
I'm adding only gypsum and epsom. It's gonna be 10 grams of gypsum and six grams of epsom salts, uh, which I've already done. I'm heating up my mash water right now. I'm trying to make this as an efficient, I'm trying to make this as time efficient of a brewing process as possible, because it's already 7 p.m. <laughs> and I'm probably gonna be up to like midnight. I enjoy brewing probably a little too much, um, but this is gonna be my last beer I'm brewing for a while. Uh, it's going, my summer's about to get very busy for the next month or so, so uh, I've loaded up my kegs pretty much. I got a German Pilsner, a lager fermenting in here right now, and then this will be my ale fermentation to go outside of it simultaneously. So, so by the time those two are ready to go, these two kegs will have been kicked and I will have a full set of all four taps running with four wildly different beers. Once I get back from all the craziness that's gonna happen during the summer, um, I'm gonna have plenty of beer options to choose from and it's gonna be wonderful. start our mash at 151 degrees so pretty much right on target so we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up and let it sit for about 90 minutes Okay, so it's about 10 minutes into the mash right now, so it's time to take a pH sample. All right, so I think our pH is right about in the right neighborhood, somewhere between 5 and 5.5. Okay, it looks like it's about 145 degrees. Okay, full disclosure, I did let this mash sit way longer than it should have. Uh, it's actually been about two hours. I was editing footage for my session IPA video, trying to get that uploaded in time. Uh, and uh, I kind of lost track of time, so it's been here for a while. This might be a little stronger than we are going for, but that's okay because my sparging method can account for that and possibly correct for it if we need to. It's time to add some hops. So we're adding our bittering addition here. So that's uh, just half an ounce of Simcoe and half an ounce of Chinook. Uh, both of these are very high alpha hops, which is why we're not using so much. In they go. Tie that off. All right, 
And now we wait for 30 minutes before adding any other hops. All right, so here's our pre-boil OG. Uh, that's about uh, 1.050, maybe 48, depending on where the actual line is. But um, I, yeah, I'm gonna call it 48, but still, Looking like a pretty nice color. It's kind of orange right now, but uh, hopefully that darkens and turns to like a rusty red kind of color in the boil, which I'm pretty sure it will. Considering we were targeting 1.051 for our pre-boil OG, that's not too bad. Okay, so it's now 30 minutes from the end of the boil, so it's time to add our 30 minute hop addition. And that is half an ounce each of Amarillo, Chinook, and Simcoe. All right, so it's now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. We're gonna add a ton of stuff, starting with our 10 minute hop edition, which is half an ounce of Amarillo, Chinook, and Simcoe. Next, we're gonna add our chiller. Next, we're gonna add uh, a world flock tablet, which has already been crushed up, and then some uh, yeast nutrient as well. And then finally, we're gonna add the full pound and a half of table sugar uh, to the boil right now. So when you're adding sugars to the boil, it's important to do so gradually so that you don't end up with a huge caramelization situation on your hands. So we just added about half of that there. Uh, keep stirring as well so that it doesn't stick to the bottom of the kettle and burn. We don't want that. We just want it to dissolve rapidly as it should. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna wait for another 10 minutes uh, and then we'll shut off all heat and we'll start cooling. Okay, so we've hit the end of our boil with zero boil overs and zero deaths. So it's time to shut off all the heat and uh, we're gonna go ahead and transfer this over to the cooling process. So we are basically going to start cooling this down from its current temperature to about 180 degrees. When it hits 180, we're going to stop the cooling process and we are going to toss in a full ounce each of Amarillo, Simcoe, and Chinook uh, to do a whirlpool or a hop stand for about 20 minutes. Um, but in the meantime, we're cooling it down and I'm just going to try and recycle some water by using my first chiller runoff that's really hot to start up the uh, sanitation process for my fermenter. Uh, speaking of fermentation, it's actually a really simple fermentation, which is a nice change for the lagers that I've been kind of obsessively brewing over the last several weeks. Uh, so it's an ale fermentation, obviously, so it's going to be 65 to 68 degrees. Um, for two or three weeks, there's really not much to it. Uh, it's a strong beer, so we're probably going to want it to attenuate, so we might ramp up that temperature towards the end of the fermentation. Uh, if we truly want the highest possible level of attenuation to come through, uh, with the lowest level of fusel alcohols. So However, we're going we're gonna to probably pitch this closer to 60. Unfortunately, my groundwater is actually relatively hot since it's summer, so it's going to take a while to bring it down to 60. Uh, the lowest it'll probably get is 70 but I'm willing to accept a little bit of fruity esters in a big beer like this. I think it's gonna be all right. Um, in a worst case scenario, I can just leave it in my fermentation chamber that's uh, doubling as my teaser for a couple hours and that'll bring it down to like 40 something. And then we can pitch from there um, and bring it up. But I think I'm gonna be all right pitching at about 70. Um, I, that is a little bit of the danger zone for esters, but I think it's gonna be okay. Uh, given it's US05, it's not really that big of an esker thrower. So the brew day went pretty well. It looks like we got about six and a half gallons post boil. Um, that includes Trube and any sort of displacement from the chiller. Probably about six gallons of usable work, um, which is exactly what I was going for. So hopefully our gravities line up. Our pre-boil OG is pretty solid. 
Um, the color so far has been looking pretty good. I just hope it's not too brown. Uh, it's a tough thing when you're doing a red IPA or any kind of red beer. Um, it's tough to get that middle ground of red and you know not catch it too dark or too light um, so that it doesn't look brown or copper. Uh, and usually that, that sweet spot is somewhere around 15 SRM, by the way. Okay, so we've hit 180 degrees now, so it's time to add the Whirlpool Edition. As you can see, I've got the lid on my kettle right now, so if anyone's worried about DMS, we just crossed under 180 degrees, which is the threshold for when it becomes volatile. So it is totally okay to have that lid on right now. And the goal of which is to trap any of those volatile hop aromas that come through when we start adding this Whirlpool addition. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and chuck that straight in the kettle right now uh, because it's gonna be fine. And we wanna make sure that we lock in all of those hop aromas if we can. Um, I'm not going to remove the chiller because I don't want to re-sanitize it, but uh, this should be sufficient right now for locking most of those things in. So we'll come back in 20 minutes and then we'll continue our chilling process. All right, so our uh, original gravity sample is here. It's, uh, it's actually sitting at about 80 degrees right now because my apartment's ambient temperature is actually 80 degrees right now post-brew. Uh, so given a little temperature correction, this turns out to be about 1078 OG, so that's two points lower than our estimated OG, which is really good because, well, that means we got the boozy, strong, hoppy beer that we wanted. So hopefully this turns out pretty good. All right, so right now it looks like the work temperature is actually still in the 80s, which is actually, regardless of the time of night, you know, 1.30, um, it's clearly too high to pitch the yeast. I refuse to do that. There's going to be too many off flavors and fusel alcohols produced by producing uh, by pitching the yeast at 80s temperatures. That's just not going to happen. We're going to go ahead and cool this down, I think, overnight, and I'll pitch the yeast in the morning. It should be at a more acceptable temperature in the morning. Um, I just aerated the hell out of it, so it should be fine uh, as far as aeration goes. Um, but I'll probably whip it up again in the morning just to be sure. Uh, but for now, we're gonna clean up and I'm gonna go to bed because I am so tired. Okay, so it's the following morning and uh, I've left the fermenter out overnight and it seems to have cooled down to the 70s, uh, which is fine. I think pitching yeast, hopefully it's gonna be okay. I pitched USO5 before at the 70s and I haven't really had any issues. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and re-aerate the wort again uh, and then toss the yeast in there. So what I think is our final gravity uh, is here. So I originally thought this was going to be about 1012, but it looks like now it's about 1010. So it's slowly continuing to ferment. Uh, now we are after two weeks. Um, so this is approaching 9% alcohol, I think, which is makes this massive. So because this is so big, I want to make sure that we get a good proper fermentation here. So we're going to let this sit at room temperature for a while, um, just to be sure the fermentation is complete. And just because of the massive amount of fermentation that's gone on, there's gonna be a couple off flavors, I think, that could get cleaned up uh, with a longer primary phase. Once that's complete, we're gonna go ahead and toss it in the fridge and we'll cold crash it to clarify the beer and drop the yeast out, and then we'll keg it. All right, so last I left you off with the final gravity of the beer, that was many weeks ago. So we ended up with a beer that was about 9% ABV and extremely hoppy. So normally in these circumstances, I would want to drink it. However, the harshness of this beer was quite pronounced. So I let this beer kind of keg and age and sit on gas for uh, many weeks, a better part of a month. And at this point, I think it is ready to drink and it's starting to mellow out some of that harshness a bit. As I mentioned earlier in the video, 
uh, traveled to you from this day and informed you that this is not actually an Imperial Red IPA. What we have here is an American Strong Ale. So uh, that is a beer that's not necessarily um, just focused on the hops. It's just a lot of everything, and it's uh, and man, does this have a lot of flavor. It's a complicated beer and it's an interesting beer, but it's definitely not what I was initially shooting for. However, I can't say that I'm not pleased with the results. Uh, it is not a backfire at all, and I'm not dumping the beer, um, but it is certainly a very aggressive beer, and um, well. It's going to take a while to get rid of it. I'll just say it that way. <laughs> so this beer ended up being called Peace Through Superior Firepower. It is 9.1% ABV and comes out to 110 IBUs. So it's basically just really angry, bitter beer. So as you can see, this beer is most definitely not red. It's kind of more of a brown color. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of like a dark, deep copper color. Um, it has some red tint to it. Um, I don't know. It's just very dark for what I was intending. Uh, definitely a result of putting a little too much uh, of the darker malts in there. Probably way too much Caramel 120, I think. Um, but, you know, it has an interesting color to it, I guess. It's, uh, it's mostly clear. It, you have to hold the light up to it to get the clarity out of it, but uh, it's got it. Um, and it holds a pretty nice head actually. It pours with a very creamy head and uh, it stays around for a couple minutes. So um, appearance is wise, interesting. Definitely not a Imperial Red IPA, but for an American Strong Ale, definitely has all those characteristics as it should be red to brown in color. So aroma, uh, aroma is actually, it's got some like burnt caramel to it um, and also a whole hell of a lot of Cascade coming out of this. Um, interesting in some of the Amarillo too. Um, I'm not particularly picking. I'm not picking up any catty kind of aroma from Simcoe or any piney aroma at all. Um, maybe someone with a more sensitive nose to hops would probably pick it up, but uh, for the most part, it's just Cascade and a little of the Amarillo. Uh, so basically, a little bit of um, kind of slight fruitiness. Um, not like a yeast fruitiness, but, uh, you know, the, and, and kind of like a, a spicy, I guess. It's not very strong, um, but it's definitely a hop aroma that's it's there. Uh, body of the beer, it's got relatively low effervescence. Um, kind of a medium body. The percentage of alcohol in this does definitely deliver a, uh, a boost to the body itself. Um, the mouthfeel of the beer is... The mouthfeel of the beer is relatively soft, um, which is it's all right. Yeah, nothing to write home about. And then finally flavor, and this is probably where the, the most detail on this beer is going to come from. So first of all, the first thing you will notice when you take a sip of this beer is it's bitter. <laughs> this is an in your face, very aggressive, like angry bitterness. Um, it's, uh, it's just really strong. <laughs> 110 IBUs, right? So, I mean, I'm not surprised that this is going on. It has a gentle alcohol warming to it, but nothing that indicates the presence of fusel alcohol. So it's not like hot. Uh, in the back of my throat, but you can definitely, like most strong beers, you can tell that there is a significant amount of alcohol in here. The malt character of this beer is very strong. Um, while not perfect, it doesn't match the hops very well. So it's got a little too much Caramel 120 in that. And uh, I say that because it has a almost bitter, darker caramel kind of woody note coming out of it um, from, I believe, the Caramel 120. So if you've ever had a young barley one, um, you might know a little bit about what I'm talking about. I'm tempted, very tempted to age this beer for a matter of months and see if it changes for the better. Um, most barley wines are very bitter and aggressive up front at first and they tend to age well. Um, and it might almost even end up like an English Burton ale, uh, 
It, it, the beer itself doesn't quite fit into a style category uh, outside of American Strong Ale. Um, it is a little arrogant bastard esque, uh, especially in my hop selection, and uh, in the the malt bill is more complicated than arrogant bastard. Uh, but this is one of those situations where everything didn't quite jive very well together. I tossed a lot of the similar ingredients in there from my standard red IPA recipe, but I just changed up the hops and then I obviously increased the amount and the number of different malts in there. Um, kind of expecting a linear scaling process, but that just definitely didn't happen. The hops are muddy when they come through. Uh, they are not really complementing each other very well, and uh, the malt just doesn't really work very well with it. It overrides a lot of what could be pleasant hop flavor, um, but instead is now kind of like a mishmash of different things. So definitely not my best beer. However, um, like I said, I want to age this and I want to see what this does uh, with many months in the keg, if I can keep it around that long. Um, because a lot of English style barley wines or even Burton nails um, will start out like this, they're very harsh, um, and then over time they mellow themselves out and become amazing beers. Uh, so I'm interested to see what that would be like, but I don't know how it would work in a keg. I'm gonna have to actually try bottling some of this and see what happens. Um, no idea what that's going to do. But, um, you know, overall, probably like a four or a five out of 10. I wouldn't really brew this again, um, but I think it's worth trying the style again, trying for the double red IPA instead of the American Strong Ale. This would be good if I had actually intended to age it. Uh, and if I had intended to age it, I would have put it in a secondary fermenter and forgotten about it for a long time. But that's not what we have here. Um, that being said, it is a monster of a beer. Uh, one of these glasses will get you feeling it for sure. But overall, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot I would change. There's a lot I would fix. Um, fix. I definitely wouldn't just add equal rates of all three hops. I would probably try to pick one hop to come out a little bit more than the others. Um, Maybe like Cascade would probably be the one to really feature in this. And I'd definitely dial back on my Caramel 120. I would dial back on, on the chocolate malt that I added. Um, I, I just kind of went a little overboard on that stuff. And definitely an interesting one. Definitely learned a lot from this one for sure. Um, but it's a fun experiment and this is exactly how we learn to make better big beers. I think a lot of times homebrewers like myself get very carried away when we're trying to brew big strong beers because we like big strong beers. <laughs> They're fun to drink and they have uh, a lot of fun aspects to them. Uh, but sometimes they can get very complicated and uh, it's kind of hard to, to manage that sometimes. But it's all good. Um, you know, I'm definitely the only person I think that would enjoy drinking this because <laughs> I have such a high tolerance for bitterness and hops. I definitely wouldn't recommend giving this to somebody who doesn't like hops or bitterness uh, because this is about their worst nightmare. But anyway, that's the end of the video. All right, everybody, thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you like the video, please hit the like button. That helps my channel a lot, helps YouTube tell uh, people that my videos are relevant. Um, if you got something to say, as long as it's civil, please feel free to drop that below in the comments section. And uh, if you want to continue watching me make beer and talk about beer and do all things beer, please consider hitting that subscribe button. If you do, hit that uh, notification bell icon that's down there. That way you get notified every single time I upload a video. So I tend to try and upload a video every couple weeks or so. Um, but more frequently, I'm actually posting to my Instagram. It's at the apartment brewer. Uh, on Instagram, I basically try to snap shots every so often during parts of the brewing process that are interesting. Uh, and you can keep tabs on what I'm brewing and uh, you can actually have a pretty advanced notice on what might be coming to the YouTube channel eventually. So uh, check that out. No obligation, of course. And down below, lastly, of course, I've listed the recipe and the equipment uh, that I used during the brew session. So feel free to check those out. I've included links to Amazon where you can see and or buy them for yourself. Full disclosure, if you do actually purchase something after clicking on that link, I do earn a very small commission, uh, but it does rest assured go back into this channel uh, for the future of the channel. Regardless of how you express it, I really do appreciate the support from everybody out there, especially my current subscribers. You guys are awesome. Uh, until next time, I'm gonna go ahead and finish off this beer, uh, and probably just this beer, the night, and I will catch you in the next one. So, cheers.